Hello, wonderful listeners. Our mini membership drive is off to a good start. Thank you so much to our two new donors. We had only asked for five, so that leaves us with just three more before we can reach our goal. So if you're interested in helping us increase from a bi-weekly release schedule to a weekly release schedule, at least from June through August, or possibly even longer, then head on over to patreon.com slash stargatesing. Thank you, and enjoy the show. <laughs> Did you hear that horn? Yeah. Yeah, that was outside my living room window don't they know you're recording a podcast i should have put up a huge flashing sign but i forgot you should like they have in radio studio or like radio recording studios should on air (laughs) as always thank you for listening to the podcast if you'd like to get in touch with us between episodes you can email us on twitter nope you can't do that (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Stargazing, a Stargate Gazing podcast. I'm your host, Kathy. And I'm your other host, Mary. And every other week, we discuss an episode of Stargate, beginning with Stargate SG 1. Hello. <clears throat> How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Doing okay. Pepper. She's being very cute, you know. She'll probably she fall asleep. She's being very cute. I know. She'll fall asleep, I'm sure, and then we'll be treated to more snores. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah. That makes for good podcasting, kitty snores. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like the broccoli tots. Oh, that's too bad. They're like 50-50 potato and cauliflower with hint of broccoli. That's weird. Which I didn't know. 20-something-ish. Nice. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I don't know. I was in a hurry. I couldn't remember what number it was. <laughs> That's okay. We were on, I don't know, I have it somewhere. 22, I think. Episode 22, unless you're going by Netflix, which is episode 21. Yeah. We're going by us. And we but said, we're going by our count. Yes. We say goes. Ha ha. We say 22. <laughs> exactly. Take that, Netflix. Yeah. And imdb was it that also disagreed or was it imdb Probably. that did agree i don't know now that we're going to be in season two i think i've mentioned before that i don't think that the odd counting is the same i like i think season two is just normal, normal. all sources seem yeah to agree hopefully yeah i think the dvds are in order as well mm-hmm. which they were not for season one yeah so how's your day man my day has been fine. What have I done today? Uh, I feel like I've been busy all day, and I don't feel like I've actually done anything important. Uh-oh. Uh, I did some writing. I did my daily writing. Nice. I practiced my violin. When I would have been normally going running, I instead did some writing and practiced my violin because I just couldn't deal with the thought of running. Nah. And I worked, and then I went for a walk, and then I did podcast editing, and now, right now, I am recording a podcast. Are you? Isn't that I interesting? Am. Yeah, it's called I, Stargazing. You might have heard of it. I have maybe heard not. Of not a whole lot of people listen yet. <laughs> it's true, but funny story. I have heard of it because <laughs> really, I am also currently recording a podcast episode. Oh my goodness! Of Stargazing. Holy crap! What a coincidence! <laughs> it's crazy. This <laughs> that is world insane. Makes no sense. Who, who would have thought? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody would have guessed. <laughs> nope. Nope. Yeah. What are you recording today on your episode of the podcast that you are recording? Well, for this one, I watched the Stargate SG-1 season one episode number 22, we'll say, called Within the Serpent's Grasp. It's Oh, in- wow. Yeah. I watched the same one. What? For my podcast. <laughs> How is that possible? I don't even know. It's like we have a hive mind. (laughs) It is. What a small world. We are Borg. (laughs) Resistance is futile. (laughs) So should we get started talking about this podcast, since we both seem to agree that we are recording the same podcast and talking about the same episode? That sounds like a good plan. We'll just do it together this time. All right. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Last episode of season one, which is crazy to me. 
it is that we have made it that far already. That's so many weeks of podcasts. It is many weeks of podcast. Yes. I don't know how many weeks I could count, but I don't that know. sounds like a lot of work, so I'm not going to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to think about it, because I is. was going to say it's double the 22, but that because every other week we release it, but yeah. we also watched the movie, and we watched the we first did. episode, though. That was two. We watched that together, one and two together. I guess then it there is... were a couple of weeks we missed here and there, too, where yeah. we didn't record anything, even though we planned to, and just, you know, holidays and True. stuff got in the way. And then we dumped uh, several episodes. We dumped. We gifted we several episodes <laughs> on, on Christmas. <laughs> That was intentional. That yes. wasn't just us being like, let's just get rid of these episodes and we'll release them today and pretend it's a present. No. <laughs> we did do that on purpose and yes, it took a lot of extra editing time. <laughs> well done. Thank you. I must say. Yeah, you should. If I do say so myself, it was a challenge that I rose to. <laughs> Woohoo! Go me. Yeah. Go me. Anyway. <laughs> This is the podcast where everyone compliments Mary. Yay! <laughs> My favorite podcast. Pepper thinks you're great, too. Oh, thank you, Pepper. I also think you're great. <laughs> she is pretty great. Yes. Do you want to start this episode, or would you like me to start this episode? I didn't read through my notes, so we'll see how this goes. All right. Well, I wrote my notes by hand as I was walking on the treadmill. So you did. Oh, we'll you didn't tell goes. me you did it by hand. I assumed you like had a tablet and you were like. Well, I did, but I was like writing it by hand on oh, the tablet instead okay. of typing. So I it got took me you. way longer because I normally type my notes. Right. And then I was on a treadmill, and yeah, <laughs> it was an interesting experience. But I wanted to multitask, and I did, and you I did. didn't kill myself by falling off the treadmill, even though I almost did at one point because. I was on it for a couple hours. Yes, I know that's a long time. But I was walking on it for a couple hours because I was trying to do like eight miles. And yes, I know that's also weird, but that's how I roll. So <laughs> apparently it times out after like an hour and 36 minutes and it just stops. Oh. So as I'm there writing, it all of a sudden just turns itself off. <laughs> that's a little scary. Yeah, it was disconcerting yeah. to just go from walking to dead stop. But I did manage to not fall off thankfully. That is good. Yeah. And then I turned it back on, resumed my walking and note-taking. Look at you, just picking up and going on. Yeah. That's how I roll. That's what I do. give up because the I treadmill did. stopped? <laughs> no, I didn't. No. Go me again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! You're, <laughs> you're crushing life right now. Like... I am. <laughs> I'm all kinds of crushing life right now. <laughs> really doesn't feel like it, but I'm going to go with that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the spirit of crushing things, I'm going to start this episode. I'm Excellent. Go first. Because <laughs> you're number so one. I am number I am number one. Yay. We start the episode on the base somewhere. We don't really know where, but what we see are some documents that say SGC in big bold letters across the top and then we see them going into a shredder and as we zoom out a little bit it turns out that apparently this is Hammond and he's shredding documents we see the red phone on his desk and Jack comes in and Hammond says he didn't realize how much paperwork was involved in shutting down a facility and that it was a pretty inauspicious end to his career not really quite what he had in mind but apparently he's going to be retiring since he was only a month out from retiring anyway when they asked him to take over the whole SGC project. Jack argues that as the only line of defense against this impending gold invasion, they should really be ignoring Kinsey's orders, but Kinsey's stopped funding, so it's not like they can just decide, well, we're going to just keep this project going anyway. I mean, where else are they going to get the $7.4 billion from if Congress has said no? Go fund me. So, yes, they... I don't think they had that back in the late 90s. Oh, right. Um, um, Kickstarter? Yeah, <laughs> for sure they had Kickstarter, yeah. Okay, good, good. See, they, there was a way. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> they had Kickstarter. Maybe a Kiva loan. I think Kiva. Oh, yeah. Kiva probably doesn't do $7.4 billion no. loans, though. I think theirs are more like in the few hundreds to maybe a couple thousand range. <laughs> Kiva's a great, uh, Kiva's great, by the way. I mm -hmm. like Kiva. 
So Hammond says that he has tried everything that he can think of, and he has talked to Kinsey twice and got kicked out by Kinsey. He <laughs> talked to the Joint Chiefs, and then finally, finally, he talked to the President, which it seemed weird to me that he saved his BFF for last rather than first. Same. But the President said, yeah, <laughs> the President said that overriding the committee would be political suicide for him. So I guess this is his first time and not his second term. Yeah, I had, I was a little like, maybe he is not on, he, maybe the president doesn't grasp the dire situation because yes. otherwise, if the planet gets destroyed, there is no politics for him <laughs> to continue. So There is no, no next election for him yeah. if everyone is dead. That is an excellent point but, that he didn't seem to grasp, but, but maybe glad that you picked up on that. Maybe the other thing is, even if he did push for it, Kinsey would still be like, nah. And then <laughs> and then they'd all die anyway, and he'd die with egg on his face. No, Kinsey sure. would die with egg on his face. The president would just die with no political clout, and wouldn't that be awful? It would be. Oh, so terrible. <laughs> so terrible. <Yeah. laughs> it's the worst fate. It is the very worst fate, dying with egg on your face. <laughs> So long story short, the moral of this whole story is that the gate is to be buried both literally and figuratively, and again, no mention of the second gate that is still out there somewhere. Nope. Nope. So we see the Stargate covered over with some sort of cloth or tarp, and the team is in the control room when Jack comes in. All the computers in the room are covered up as well in cloth, so it really they're really shutting down there. No one's there except for SG-1, which is unusual. Jack's delivering the, it's not really news, but reiterating that it is all over, and that the day after tomorrow they're going to bury the gate. Tilk says he needs to go home ASAP. And Daniel's like, we all should be going, and we should be going to the coordinates of the alternate universe planet that I got. Or that he got. I'm being Daniel right now, but... <laughs> it's just... It's hard to differentiate oneself from the character. <laughs> I confuse myself with one Daniel. Is watching on TV. <laughs> me and Daniel, too, we're like peas in a pod. We're practically really the are. same person. Like You're so much alike. Yeah. I've often thought that. Often when I'm watching this show, I'm like, wait a minute. How did Kathy get on the... Oh, it's Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a little uh, questioning of Daniel's trip to the alternate dimension because... Daniel still has to insist it's real. Then... I didn't understand still why they're so skeptical I don't... after all the stuff they've seen so far. I don't know. Wishful thinking. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they're willing to take his word that there's the possibility of danger anyway. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Sam asks how they know the address actually works in this reality, correlates with the same thing in the other reality. And Daniel's like, there's only one way to find out. So Daniel sort of lays on thick his trying to convince them they have to go. He's like, by the time he got out of there, Sarah was dead in the other world. Your family was dead, Sam. Everybody's dead. Dead, Jim. Yep. <laughs> so Jack's like, I get it. But Daniel keeps going. Like, how would you feel if we don't go through and we get attacked? And Carter wants to know how the four of them will stop the attack. Daniel says they have a better chance trying now than waiting till the attack arrives. Tilk thinks they have a chance of being undetected if they do go because the gold wouldn't expect them to go because the coordinates were not on the Abydos cartouche. I don't know if this is interesting or not. Anyway. <laughs> it's relevant. Yeah. It, I mean, it makes sense. It justifies why they think that yeah. they might have any impact. And then Tilk's like, a medical attack check. might be successful. <laughs> 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 Jack corrects him. He says it's the phrase is surgical Sur attack. And Jack also says he'd feel like an idiot if they don't do something answering Daniel's question. So he says they should go. Teal also volunteers to go. They kind of look at Sam, but she is in. So they're all going to go. Yeah. He specifies to Sam, too, that it's not an order. And she's like, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> but she's in anyway. A little while later... They're all in the control room, dressed in black, and they've got black beanies on, and they basically look like they're about to rob a bank. 
We hear the unauthorized gate activation alarm going off, and Jack orders Sam to close the blast doors and seal all the surrounding hallways. She says she needs an authorized officer's credentials to do that, so of course Jack's got those and types them in. Out in the hall, guards are running, and Hammond is looking pretty angry as he storms down the hall with a team of guards behind him. They try to get in, but of course they can't because the door was just locked, so he orders them to go around and check corridor C, and... He also tells somebody else to make sure that you get this door open. Back in the control room, they at least had the foresight to send a MALP through. So that was good. Even though they didn't have a whole lot of time, it's probably good that they did do it. Yeah. The MALP doesn't see anything, and they realize that it's just dark on the other side. So they turn the lights on and see a whole bunch of Egyptian symbols. And then a notice comes through over the loudspeaker that there's been a security breach. And they realize that that corridor, that C9 corridor that's right outside, has been breached by the other military people. So SG-1 runs down into the gate room and they get through the gate just as Hammond and the guards come in, barely missing them. And that's it. The gate closes after them. Ah! What's gonna happen? Ah! We don't have to wait long to find out what happens next. Just through the credits. Nope. So we see a room that the team is in through so the some night vision goggle style view. Mm -hmm. We see St Teal'c standing in the gate, the mouth, the DHD. And Jack takes off the goggles and then they all turn on their flashlights. Jack orders Daniel to send the mouth back through. Sam notes there are no doors or windows and Teal'c says that those things are often disguised within the structure. There are a bunch of boxes, crates, I don't know, cargo hanging around. Jack asks about them and Teal'c says that the gold must be sending or receiving something through the gate. So they decide to have a look inside one of them. In the background you can see that Daniel has opened the gate and is sending them out back through. They open one of the the crates and it kind of opens fun like the, the top of it. I don't know, it opens yeah. up and portions and it's kind of cool looking it did yeah i have like segmented yeah nice job props department yeah 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 so we see inside what looks like some kind of staffs although not necessarily weapons at least the staff ones i thought they looked kind of like the staff weapons no yeah. one of Maybe them I, I think enough. i think one of them did the other one just kind of looked like a staff and looked like it had a jewel on the end or something oh anyway they ignore those all together and yeah. They pick up the other- Jack picks up the other thingy that's in there, which is some small little- It turns out to be like a gun. Yeah. A, a, a Jaffa gun. A gold gun. Yeah. Handgun. As opposed to the big staff weapons. Right. And it looks like a snake. It did! Lot. Yeah. Yeah. Teal calls it a Zetnikatel or something mm -hmm. to that effect? Yeah, that's what I heard. He explains it uh, uses a different energy source than the staff weapons and is less powerful, however still deadly. Jack's like, sweet, pass them out. And he also decides to call it a Zat gun because Zat Nicotel, and I agree, <laughs> is just too much. It's a challenge. Yeah. Tilk shows him how to fire it. He explains that one shot from that will be very painful to the, the target, but not deadly. But if you shoot him twice, it will kill them. They hear a loud whirring noise and then they're knocked off their feet. Except for Teal'c, of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Daniel wants to know what that was. Sam guesses a weird planetary shift. Daniel tries to dial home then because they decide to get out of there. But the gate will not connect. Uh oh. Yeah. It was just what Daniel planetary. said. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just then a door opens so the team scatters to hide amongst the boxes as a line of Jaffa guards march in. It's a good thing that the doors open so slowly and loudly so that they had time to run and hide first. It's true. <laughs> Did you notice while they were hiding? Like I was I was very surprised by how obsessive Daniel was staring at the vision goggles that were on the floor. Yeah, I think the implication is it was like right next to one of the guards' feet, so okay. I think the implication was that like he was worried they were going to see it and realize that there was someone in there. Yeah, so, but that does not happen, fortunately. 
It doesn't. Yeah, the guards showing up was just a coincidence. They didn't actually know no. anybody was in there. The and guards... apparently not at all observant either. Because Jack's like just ducking behind the DHG, which isn't that big, mm-hmm. and like no, it's not. It's like when they were hiding behind trees in yeah. the episode with the Knox. <laughs> Well, apparently SG-1 is extremely stealthy in tiny spaces. <laughs> they are. <laughs> apparently. Yeah. The guards have business, though. They stop near the gate, and I'm not sure how this happens. Like, I don't know if there was, like, any kind of controls. I don't see any controls at all with this big sphere that floats out. No, they just... To me, it just looked like they opened the crate that it was in, and okay. then it just automatically went and did its thing. Okay. So they open a crate and this big sphere comes out and floats over and positions itself, basically, in the center of the Stargate. Mm -hmm. Then they turn and they leave. Yep. It was very (laughs) anticlimactic. Yeah. So it's good. The team's not discovered. Mm Woohoo! They come out of hiding. Daniel retrieves the goggles he was obsessing with and... (laughs) I don't know why this is so problematic for me, but apparently I'm just like, oh, Daniel, obsessing about night vision goggles. <laughs> <laughs> so they ask about the sphere, and Teal'c says it's like an advanced TV. Jack's like, think it gets showtime? Teal'c's Come not, on. yeah. Teal'c's not amused. <laughs> and, but What does a showtime? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't actually ask that. No. <laughs> Uh, but he should have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he should have. So now that uh, Teal'c notes that now that they saw where the doors are, he can get it open. <laughs> Did you notice, though, that when they actually showed the doors, they weren't blended into the architecture, like, at all? <laughs> they were very clearly, like, these big hangar bay doors in a wall. And... So they really shouldn't have needed anyone to show them where the doors were. It was pretty obvious. They have they have they have door blindness, right? That's a thing. <laughs> I think I heard that was a thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Some people have face blindness and other people have door blindness. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So they head out. Teal gets the door open and they head out. Daniel straggles a little bit but eventually catches up. And then they're just sneaking down the corridors, trying not to get caught by Jeffa's soldiers marching through them. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of convenient alcoves for them to hide in, there I've noticed. really Because are. every- t- Like, there's constantly guards going by, and every time that a stream of guards comes by, there's always a convenient and pointless alcove for them to hide yeah, in. Yeah, there, there doesn't seem- <laughs> Like, the, the walls of the corridors aren't, like, a solid wall. There are all kinds of little, like, yeah. Yeah, nooks and crannies built in, or like a wall, and then right. you can hide behind it, and then yeah, yeah, it's and every corridor is very curved so that you can't see far enough <laughs> down one to for any of the guards to be able to see them, so they can hear the guards around every corner because you know convenient. Yeah, but the guards can't see them because the, the none of the hallways are straight. <laughs> very well designed. Yeah, <laughs> they were not anticipating sneaking around. No, when they, they designed weren't. that. Apparently not. Back on Earth, Walter confirms to Hammond that the team that left was SG-1 and that they went to the coordinates that Daniel had been going on about for the last however long it's been. With Walter and Hammond in the hallway is Ferretti, apparently, and he says that SG-2 is standing by and ready to go and get SG-1. And Hammond says, well, you'd only be bringing them back for courts martial, which amused me to find out that it's the first word that's pluralized, like attorneys general. I don't know why that amuses me, but it does. Yeah, so not court marshals, courts martial. So Freddie asks if he can speak freely, and Hammond says, of course. And he says that he wants to go back up SG-1 because of all of the, the help and support that he's gotten from Jack over the years. But Hammond says that he really can't have them take that risk. Not to mention that it would be a violation of their orders, but he doesn't really seem to be caring about that at this point. So he says he'll take it into advisement when Ferrari in- emphasizes the fact that SG-2 is willing to take whatever risk they need to take in order to go help SG-1 out. Yeah. SG-1 is continuing to wander around these halls. It's dark, and all the walls are gold, and it's 
engraved, or I think it's actually a relief. It looks like the hieroglyphics are kind of sticking up, but there's hieroglyphics all over every single wall. They find a room that's got a sarcophagus in it, and everyone goes in to check it out, and Jack asks who might be in it, but Tilk isn't listening. And so they go to see what is distra distracting Tilk, and it turns out Tilk is the only one that noticed this giant glowing window out into a void of space. <laughs> So they all go up to look out the big giant window and realize that they're not on a planet. This is actually a ship. And Tilk says that what they felt as that jolt must have actually been hyper launch. Uh oh. Yeah, that's problematic. Yeah. Although hyper launch looks pretty nice. Yeah. It does, it's very pretty. Yeah. Back on Earth, the Stargate is dialing. Hammond seems to have decided to let SG2, and it looks like a whole bunch of other people, <laughs> go through the gate to try to bring back SG1 alive. But they are thwarted because Chevron 7 will not lock. Walter doesn't know why. Yeah. Hammond says, I find out. I like that Hammond was also taking the time to tell them that, you know, we're going to send a map through first, and then if it's okay, you can go <laughs> to, like, wouldn't that already be their standard operating procedure here anyway? Why did he need to take the time to explain that? Maybe, maybe the whole group is just, like, so hyped up about this that they were ready to run through the second the gate opened. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I don't know. Back on what we now know is a ship. Jack asks Tilk why he didn't tell them before that this was a ship and not a planet. And Tilk says, well, he wasn't sure because he's never actually been on a ship like this. He said it accelerates differently and most ships don't have stargates on them. A guard suddenly comes in, weapon drawn, and shoots at them. Sam shoots once and then she shoots twice for good measure and we know what that means. And then Tilk shoots a third time and that conveniently disposes of the body. What? <laughs> One shot hurts him, two shots kill him. The third shot... Disintegrates him. Oh, great. You didn't feel this was worthy of mention, I take it. Sam noticed that when the guard shot at them, it hit the window and seemed to kind of spread out, like it was some kind of an energy field, and Tilk says that's correct, there isn't any kind of clear substance like glass or anything else that would be able to withstand their current velocity. And Sam's like, or temporal displacement. And she has guessed at this point that they must be traveling faster than the speed of light. And Tilk says that is correct. So this is when Sam realizes that when they got onto the ship, they must have been orbiting around some planet. And then after that, jumped to light speed. And that, of course, is why the gate isn't working. Because the point of origin isn't valid anymore, as Daniel chimes in. Jack, he's like, well, I guess the two of you better figure out how to get us home. And Sam's like, well, the only way that we can do that would be to turn the ship around and go back to where we started. So Daniel's like, I'm just going to go tell the pilot that. <laughs> Jack asks Tilk if he would actually be able to fly a ship like this, but Tilk says he's not really sure because it's new technology and the only thing he's actually qualified to be flying is a death glider. So he suggests that they leave this room, at least, as soon as possible, because that sarcophagus that's in the middle of the room is not going to be left unattended for long. I had noted that the Joppa guards always march side by side in two rows, and I was just <laughs> like, they're not like sand people. They're not worried about hiding their numbers, <laughs> which is dumb. I just... <laughs> it's still amusing, though. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Probably not leaving a whole lot of footprints on that hard tile floor or whatever it's made out of. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> the team is hiding, again, inside the walls or wherever. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> the sneaky music playing in the background, did you notice that? Off and on through the episode, I think, right? Yeah. It's kind of fun. I don't know. <laughs> it was. But they're hiding again. Jack's trying to see what the Jeffa and the, hall, the corridor are doing, but Daniel is looking in the other direction, and he spots a room full of death gliders, which are kind of pretty colors. Yeah. <laughs> they were. It's really convenient that this dark black that they're wearing, the matte black that they're wearing, is imperceptible against a shiny gold background. Otherwise, it would be super easy for anybody in that hangar to see them True. hanging out in front of this gold wall in front of them. <laughs> but they don't. No. 
No. They realize they are on an attack ship headed to Earth. What? Sam is able to calculate they have a long time before they get to Earth based on the coordinates of the planet they gated to and the speed of the ships, uh, the ship, which is going 10 times the speed of light. That is not okay. Everyone knows that when you go that fast, you turn into a giant salamander. <laughs> How did they not think of this when they decided to make their ship go this fast? <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they better watch out. They might de-evolve. <laughs> and then mate and have babies. <laughs> it's a very real possibility. <laughs> <laughs> According to these calculations, Samson's going to take at least a year before they get to Earth. So they'll have that was a close one. Plenty, plenty of time. lizard babies by the time they get there. <laughs> so many lizard babies by the time they get there. Salamanders are not lizards; they're amphibians. Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> I don't know animals. <laughs> Except cats, maybe. I know. Well, my my thesis was in herpetology, so Fair. if I don't at least know that much, then I'm in trouble. <laughs> they hear some kind of loudspeaker type message that you can't quite hear what is being said and probably it's in gold or whatever. Daniel says they're being summoned, summoned to a gathering. Ga gathering. <laughs> a gathering. <laughs> gathering at the water hole. <laughs> they're on their way to Time a gathering. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Daniel says they're being summoned to a gathering. Jack sees that the sarcophagus is on the move so they decide to follow oh okay that answers some questions i had because i missed that part where the sarcophagus was moving or being moved yeah well you know you, you'd be yeah. forgiven for focusing on the hangar bay <laughs> full of death gliders and I the was. lizard babies so yeah. or the lizards there's no babies yet i'm sorry i'm jumping ahead in the process the amphibian babies are not here yet they will and be i here keep eventually. calling them lizards because i'm a monster you are a monster they're not even that closely related nope for shame. De evolving. There's a joke. There's a Jonathan Colton song called De evolving, by the way. But it's about a it's about a guy de evolving into. Uh, he says monkey, but I know that you will probably also not be okay with that. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> it turns out that everybody is gathering back in the gate room. There's a whole bunch of Jaffa and somebody in fancy dress, maybe a gold. I don't know. We don't actually really see this person again, but they no. seem to be really like close up focusing on this person for a minute. So I thought that they might be important, <laughs> but no. So I don't even know why I'm continuing to talk about them. They're important. <laughs> Are they? Yeah. The television. Vizier <laughs> takes a crystal ball like appearance and we see Apophis in it and he speaks and all the Jaffa bow down to him and then he conveniently starts speaking in English instead so that was very nice of him <laughs> he was it's like he knew even there was he an audience there were any, yeah. <laughs> even though he didn't realize there were any humans from earth in the room he you know he was whatever <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> And so he says that soon they're going to wipe out the scourge that plagues them, and a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's the basic gist of the conversation. And then he says that until he can join all the Jaffa and servants on this ship, they're going to follow the orders of his son, as if those orders were his own. And the sarcophagus opens slowly and dramatically. Was it on a timer? It probably. Yeah, so that is a good question. It was like perfect timing. The sarcophagus <laughs> is such a mystery. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Apophis proclaims, bow down to my son, the mightier warrior Corel, and they all bow down. And this kid that rose up out of the sarcophagus with his back facing us slowly turns around. And OMG, it's Scara, <gasps> who is apparently now named Corel. I think it's chlorel. And chlorel? Yeah. 
all I kept thinking was Kal El. Ah, and... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly a very different person. <laughs> yes, that was, that's a very different story. I yeah. think. <laughs> so Clorel speaks, although we don't know what he actually says, and everyone bows down to him. Ooh. Yeah. Everyone leaves the gate room after the big reveal. <laughs> Besides SG-1. Yeah. So Jack's pretty disgusted that Apophis is calling Skara his son. Can we call him Sklarel? Sklarel, yes. <laughs> we can. <laughs> the amalgamation of Skara and Chlorel. <laughs> yes. Daniel helpfully says that Apophis probably seated Sklarel or whatever and <laughs> cho- you know it's just gross and jack out it's not cool yeah. no yeah. so jack makes a plan they're gonna split up carter and daniel are tasked with planting c4 all over the ship that sounds fun yeah. jack and teal were going to go get sclarel <laughs> sam has her doubts about this being a good plan she thinks he's being emotional but Jack thinks it's also the most strategic decision that could be made. And Daniel agrees. They're all in agreement. Sam was just, you know, asking questions. Um, <laughs> but Daniel agrees. Teak seems to, seems to agree as well. He, he said that Glorel would not be under heavy guard. Daniel thinks that maybe they can get through to Skara out of the Sklarel mash. Because Kendra could fight the gold inside her. And Sam asks, well, what's the contingency plan? And Jack's like, C4. Boom. <laughs> Mic drop. Walk away. It's a good contingency plan. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the window room, apparently after lugging the whole giant sarcophagus to the gate room, they lugged it back again. <laughs> Here, I felt really bad for those guys that were like, this thing is huge and made of gold. It's got to be super heavy. I don't know why they felt the need to move it for that 30 seconds of dramatic reveal before, <laughs> only to then lug it back here. It seems pretty ridiculous. But I, you know, they don't care about what the Jaffa are doing, no. so about making them do this hard work. So, <laughs> in the window room, it turns out to actually be a control room because Corel, Sklar. Sclorel. <laughs> Scara Chlorel looks out the window and he raises up what turns out to be like a control panel kind of thing. Jack and Teal rush in and there's a firefight. They take down to the guards. Chlorel's eyes glow and he brings up a sparkle bling. And then he just kind of like waves his hand around in the air with the sparkle bling lit up. It was kind of just silly looking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's waving it in the general direction of Jack, who's at the far end of the room. And Teal'c, who had been hiding at the far end of the sarcophagus, so it's like lengthwise between him and Chlorel, suddenly somehow managed to run the full 10-foot length and attack Chlorel from behind. <laughs> Even though a few seconds ago when we saw Chlorel standing at those controls, you could see that clearly down either side of the sarcophagus so like Chlorel should have totally been able to see Tilk coming <laughs> but he didn't no. so Tilk doesn't really tackle him but he kind of grabs him from behind and pins his arms down at his sides so why Chlorel wasn't able to just like turn his wrist and blast Tilk standing behind him I don't really know but apparently he couldn't and Jack comes out from hiding at this point now that Chlorel's basically been neutralized and Chlorel's like, how dare you do this to me? How dare you do this to Chlorel? <laughs> and <laughs> he says, you will die a painful death. And Jack's like, whatever. <laughs> Tilk describes a raised serpent hieroglyph to Jack and tells him to go to the wall and turn it and push it. And apparently that closes the door. So Tilk shoots the glyph, which apparently breaks it essentially and then there's another one and jack does the same thing to the other one so now they're at least for the time being sealed in here it'll take them time to get through the doors now that they've the controls have been blasted and jack walks up and says hey scara long time no see yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> that's that yeah. scene. <laughs> then, while that's happening, Daniel and Sam are busy sneaking around the hallways, hiding from Jaffa guards, and all of their convenient little nooks. Why have so many of you switched from toast to Thomas's English muffins? Definitely the granny. It was the nooks. They had oh, some English muffins. Ooh, I had one for breakfast. I love <laughs> English muffins. This is just making me think of the Nixon cranes. <laughs> <sighs> I love English muffins so much. I, too. I didn't have one for breakfast. I had waffles. Oh, nice. But I often have English muffins for breakfast. Yeah, I have them a lot. Waffles sound amazing, too. Mm-hmm. I love waffles. Yeah, me, too. So we eat waffles, but Daniel and yep. Sam go to Hangar Bays to... <laughs> plant C4 on death gliders. Yep. They figure there being fuel in those death gliders, it will hopefully start some sort of chain reaction in blowing one of them up. So, that's that scene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back in the window room slash control room, whatever that room is with the sarcophagus in it, Jack is trying to get through to Scara and tells Scara to remember him and introduces Tilk, but it is apparently still Chlorel that they're talking to, and he's like, ah, Tilk the traitor, and says that he's going to have great pleasure delivering Tilk's head to his father. And Jack emphasizes Apophis is not your father, but Chlorel says he is my father, seed of the mother, and he chose the body that I will live out eternity in. And Jack says he doesn't mean the thing in his head, he's talking to Scara, not to Chlorel. But Chlorel, of course, reminds him that nothing of the host survives, and Jack doesn't want to believe that. But then Chlorel, just kind of trying to rub things in, tells him that Skara had a feeble mind and suffered very greatly before then easily giving in what an to asshole. the control of Chlorel. Yeah, he really is an asshole. <laughs> so Jack punches him, which seemed pretty mean to me, since, like, it's still Skara's body that he has now just yeah. punched <laughs> in the face. <laughs> So Clarell kind of laughs it off and says that he's not going to kill Jack, but might try to make a host out of him himself. And Jack says to Tilk, you promised that this thing is not going to kill him? He says, you know, talking about his that gun. And Tilk confirms, nope, takes two blasts to kill him. So Jack says he's going to shoot Clarell if he doesn't let Scara talk. But Clarell says that that would only hurt Scara. And Jack's like, well, he's a tough kid, so it'll be fine. And Clarell's like, no, he's too too scared to come forward. He doesn't want to come forward. So Clarell backed down on what he had just said about nothing of the host surviving pretty quickly on yeah. that one. Because since he is now saying, no, Scar is just too scared to come out. And he says that Scar is enjoying Clarell's protection and doesn't want to talk to anybody. Mm. So Jack shoots him. And Clarell collapses in a ball of lightning. And then suddenly, Scar calls out for Sharae and Daniel, and Jack rushes to him. And Skara tells Jack that it really hurts, and asks if Jack is still his friend. It was really sad, Aww. because Jack says he still is his friend, and Skara asks if Jack can ever forgive him for what they're about to do. And uh -oh. Jack's like, what are you about to do? And they kind of, you know, Skara's kind of panicking at this point, and Jack's like, like, you really need to tell me what to do. But then Clorel takes over again, guards come in, Staff weapons are pointed at Jack, and they order him to release Clarell, but Jack and Tilk exchange several dramatic looks, and <laughs> Clarell smirks. There's a lot of face acting here. Is. Jack asks Skara to help him, but we see the eyes glow, so we know that it is actually Clarell and not Skara there right now. And the Jaffa leader guy who doesn't get a gold tattoo on his face for whatever reason but just has a plain black one says that they need to release Clarell or they're going to kill Jack but Tilk says well if you kill Jack then I'm going to click kill Clarell and so the Jaffa says that that would only kill the host too many more glances are exchanged at this <laughs> point with a lot of talking in this scene this person said and that person said but then Jack lowers his weapon Clarell gets up and shoots Jack with his at gun, but only once. So he's Ooh. not dead. And then he orders the Jaffa not to fire on him and says his father is going to be very pleased that now they have not just the traitor, but also the human that recruited him as their captives. No! 
Yes. <sighs> Meanwhile, Sam and Daniel are continuing to seed the ship with C4. They are in the gate room putting some on the Stargate so that the Nakoda will ampli amplify the explosion. Mm -hmm. Daniel's looking at the spear going, hope they can't see us through it. <laughs> but then the doors open in their big loud warning fashion so Sam and Daniel hide <laughs> behind the Stargate. A strange thing to hide behind since it's... Like the the ring isn't that wide. Yeah, I think it looked like they jumped behind <laughs> and, the on like the behind the platform it's on. I, oh, I, did they? Yeah. Okay, I don't remember. Yeah, that they weren't just like let's stand in a curved way. So <laughs> <laughs> let's stand with our straight bodies behind this curved thing. It seems like a thing that they would do, given what we know about their tactical or their stealth That's skills. True. So. <laughs> <laughs> but they did jump behind. I did see that. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> Clorel and his entourage enter with Jack and Teal'c. The sphere activates, so Clorel can present Jack and Teal'c to his daddy. <laughs> Jack's like, hey, Pops. <laughs> Apophis is rightly alarmed and wants to know where they came yeah. from and if there are <laughs> any more of them. <laughs> Jack's like, oh yeah, I brought a whole army. <laughs> But Clorel, for some reason, is like, I assure you, there can be no more. Right. Okay. They didn't even check the ship to make sure there weren't any more, obviously, because I can't imagine Daniel and Sam would have been that hard to find if they'd really taken a good look for They them. could literally hide an army in the hallways. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so Apophis orders that Teal'c must suffer the most painful death, the removal of his hagfish. <laughs> and they're going to make Jack watch Teal'c suffer and die Chlorel gets to choose how Jack dies though but he has to do it soon because they got they got stuff going on yeah I've got my country's 500th anniversary to plan my wedding to arrange my wife to murder and Gilda to frame for it I'm swamped Apophis out yeah. so there is a priest a Jaffa priest who grabs some really mean looking I don't even want to call it a knife. I don't know what it was. It like had two blades. I was I'm like, how is it doesn't how is yeah. it gonna is it supposed to clamp it or are they just gonna kill the they wouldn't kill it, right? Because I wouldn't think so, but it's I was wondering about that too, because like wouldn't you want to more gently remove it so that you don't kill it? Like, but that thing looks yeah pretty deadly to both Jaffa <laughs> and Gold. Yeah, I didn't know how they were gonna do that. <laughs> but anyway, they have this really mean looking to <laughs> Yeah weapon it's like a fork but way worse yeah. <laughs> way scarier a scary fork <laughs> as they're moving that towards teal jack yeah. is appealing to the scara inside chlorel don't let this happen don't let him do this chlorel then does seem to have a change of heart not sure if that's scara influence or if he just really right. hates jack and wants to show him this wonderful surprise um, <laughs> but they he orders them taken to the Peltec uh, something which, like that Pelotec yeah something, something like that something along those lines yeah <laughs> and they all head there uh, Sam and Daniel get up from behind the gate to go after them good oh. thing that nobody noticed the C4 that they had planted on the front of the gate before yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're just not very observant in the gate room I guess <laughs> no I guess not no. So they get up. Sam says they've got to go after them. And Daniel's like, what about our big plan to blow up the ship? And Sam says, that's a last resort. But Daniel's like, what if we get captured or killed? Then there will be no one left to do it. Sam, though, is a smart lady, as we know. So she has put the mm -hmm. C4 on a 24-hour timer. So if something happens yep. to them, that ship is going to blow in a day. Boom. Yeah. yeah. So they decide to go. Yeah, they do. Back in the window room, control room, sarcophagus room place, there are guards, there's a Tilk, there's a Daniel, there's a Clorel, and Clorel asks Jack if he wishes to go home to his planet, and Jack's like, of course I do, and Clorel says something to one of the Jaffa, and the Jaffa puts his hand on a big crystal ball 
kind of thing, which is much smaller than the other big <laughs> crystal ball television sphere kind of thing. They really like their balls on this ship. <laughs> Tilk tries to tell Jack to be prepared for... But then he's cut off and Jack is flung into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tilk finishes his sentence, extreme deceleration. <laughs> How everyone else prepared for this extreme deceleration when they weren't holding on to anything and there was nothing for them to hold on to, I have no idea. But somehow they managed to brace themselves anyway. They're, they're all expert subway riders, so they're used to the lurching <laughs> yes. and they're used to Absolutely. holding themselves steady. Yeah, stand sideways, never stand yeah. like facing the front. Yeah, <laughs> it's easier to brace yourself yeah. that way. So apparently that ball was the brakes. And Jack looks out the window and is very dismayed to realize that what he's seeing out there is Saturn. And Clarell says that you will get to see your home one last time, and then everyone on your planet will be destroyed. Uh oh. Yeah. So your kind will disturb the Gwauld. No more. <laughs> and they look out the window and dramatically pass underneath Saturn's rings. Oh dear, that's very close. It is very close. On Earth, that's a place that we're concerned about. <laughs> and that things happen on. Yeah. Walter reports that their deep space radar has picked up blips passing Saturn. Uh -oh. They don't know what it is. You know, the bleeps. They're repositioning the Hubble telescope to get a closer look. Hammond comments that Jackson's lucky he won't be around to watch his nightmare come true a second time. <laughs> yeah, that's weird, but okay. <laughs> and Hammond walks away to talk on the red phone. <laughs> yep. That's nice of him to think of Daniel and his time yeah. of need. <laughs> yeah, just, just, that's your first thought yeah. right now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Back on the ship, Sam and Daniel continue to sneak around more. More guards come. They hide again because there's just all those nooks and crannies still for them to be hiding in. The guards, of course, pass without seeing them because the guards are very unobservant on this ship. <laughs> And then Sam and Daniel come back out and continue to follow the Jaffa and find that all those Jaffa have gone to the hangar and are now getting into the death gliders that are hanging in the hangar. More yikes. Yes. On Earth, Hammond is briefing SGC personnel. Uh, he tells them that the president is mobilizing all branches of the armed forces, including the National Guard and the Reserves. What about the rest of the world, I wonder? But Yeah, that is a very good question. They have armies and have stuff, Have they bothered too. to tell anybody else? I don't know. I suspect... I mean, I know it's top secret, but still, maybe you should have told the, them something. The world is ending. Maybe you want to let people know. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. So, the Air Force efforts, though, are going to be coordinated through the SGC. And they have no more details on the blips that they saw. That's about what that <clears throat> scene was. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> really. Walter's on the phone. Yeah. Got no updates. Yeah. Very exciting. Back on the ship. It was a very exciting <laughs> scene. <laughs> Back on the ship, Sam and Daniel hide in yet another corner as more guards march past. I feel like half of this episode was just <laughs> guards marching past and them finding corners to hide in. <laughs> So they sneak up on the room with the window and the sarcophagus and the control panel and see the other SG-1 people in there with everybody else that I mentioned was in there before. Sam lures the guards out with a smoke canister in the hallway. And when they come out, she and Daniel start firing and take them out. They make their way into the control room and Tilk and Jack take advantage of the distraction at this point to join in the fight and Jack takes a nice axe handle strike to one of them which I appreciated <laughs> and the firefight continues and SG-1 does get the upper hand taking out a whole bunch of the Jaffa Daniel tries to sneak around the sarcophagus but this time apparently Corel learned his lesson from last time when he didn't bother to look at the sarcophagus <laughs> and so he does see Daniel sneaking up and Sparkle blings him in the face Jack picks up the, the weapon that Daniel dropped when 
Chlorel started to sparkle blinging his face. And it says Scar's name. The sparkle blinging continues as Daniel's kind of kneeling there, mesmerized, in pain. Kind of, I don't know, what would you call that? Yeah, I feel like that seems kinda, pretty, yeah. Yeah, just kind of mesmerized, I guess. Yeah, I'm, uh, like my brain wants to form words, but it's not happening. Same, yeah. yeah. So the sparkle blinging of Daniel continues as Daniel kind of kneels there, like mesmerized, staring up at the sparkle bling thing. Jack calls to Scar again and points his gun at him. And Tilk calls Jack and tells him not to take action here. Jack continues trying to call Scar's name and to get Scar to come back out and to really kind of take control of his own body again. But it doesn't work. And Jack fires and he looks completely devastated immediately after doing yeah. so. Sam runs to check on Daniel. We hear what is clearly meant to be Scar's voice at this yeah. point, and Jack runs up and holds him and apologizes, and then Scar dies. Sad. It was very sad. Yeah. I was not happy, obviously. No. That, no. <laughs> that would be a weird thing to be happy about. No. But yeah, it's upsetting because, you know, you get to really like him. I really liked him from the movie, yeah. so it's, it's a very sad scene. Daniel is, of course, distraught, too, because Scar was essentially, like, his little brother, his brother-in-law. Yeah. And Tilk tries to get O'Neill's attention and says his name, and Jack's like, just give me a minute. But Tilk says, I cannot. So they show a view out the window, and we see Earth. Uh-oh. Sam says Earth, yeah. just in case anyone had any doubt that this was clearly Earth we're seeing outside the window. And Daniel's like, I thought you said it was going to take a year to get here. And Sam's like, well, I guess we were traveling a whole lot faster than 10 times the speed of light. And she tells Jack that they saw the death gliders being prepped for launch. And we get a view of all of the SG team kind of looking out the window from the vantage point of the window. And we zoom out and continue zooming out more. And we see the whole ship showing that viewpoint in through the window at SG-1. And then as it continues to zoom out even more, we see that there is also a second giant ship behind this first one. Two. And then we get the to be continued flashing across the screen. And season one is over. It is. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. Two ships. Ooh. Two dollars. Shit. Two ships. Ships plural. Yes. Holy hell. Wow. Also, I think that the last episode ended with the four of them staring at the Stargate, and then this one it ends did. with the four of them staring out the window. Yeah, so both both end with them with a view of the team that then zooms backwards out through a window. Yeah. I thought it was cool looking. Yeah, I yeah. liked the the cinematography. Yeah. of it. It was good. I guess you'd call it. Yeah, yeah. Both times, I I enjoyed it both times. Oh yeah. yeah, that was the episode. Sure was. What did you think of the episode? Um, I thought it was exciting, except for all the sneaking around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was exciting too, because you never knew if yeah. they were gonna get caught. But yeah, um, yeah, I like a good let's infiltrate and try to blow up a thing thing. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, sad to see Scara, but good to see Scara. <laughs> yeah, and I I just you know. I'm very happy that we're watching this not as it aired because, you know, <laughs> I hated waiting for Cliffhanger yes. TV series to start up again. It was annoying. So I like it. Is. I'm okay with the Cliffhanger this time because we can just yes, watch it. Because we have Netflix and DVDs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Except that I snuck into your house and destroyed all your DVDs, and then I also wrote to Netflix and told them to cut off your service. Wow. So. That, <laughs> and they did. Wow. That, that seems extreme, but... It was, <laughs> but worth it. <laughs> no season two uh, no. No. until fall. No. <laughs> Fall's a really long time. Yep. Sucks to be you. <sighs> Meanwhile, I'll be continuing the show on my own throughout the summer. <laughs> All right, well. Just out of spite. <laughs> and you can't listen to the podcast either, so you'll still never know what happened. You're a monster. <laughs> I need new friends. Yeah, anybody got any too. friends? Does anybody want to be my friend? 
Of course they did. <laughs> My mom will pay you. <laughs> it's true. Back in high school, you made all kinds of money. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my thoughts on the episode are pretty much the same as yours i found it to be a very enjoyable episode i mentioned it's been quite a while since i've actually watched this show all the way through yeah. like we're doing now so a lot of like i remember kind of like general story arc of the whole show but then there's like a lot of stuff that i've forgotten so i really didn't remember a whole lot of this storyline nice. um so i found it to be very enjoyable and of course i was very upset when scara died i remembered that he did die but i didn't remember when or how so I was not necessarily expecting it to be this soon. I actually thought that maybe it wouldn't probably be until, like, the... I knew this was a two-parter, so I thought maybe it would be in the next episode. I was surprised it happened yeah. this early. And it was sad. And it was really sad to see how it affected all the characters that were, yeah. you know, still left. So to see how it affected Jack and Daniel was, was really sad. And I think it's made that much worse by the fact that, you know, Jack's son obviously died by killing himself and then for jack to then have to kill this kid who he also really cared about and who reminded him of his own son made that scene that much harder yeah yeah so rough scene but a very good episode in my yeah. opinion overall i enjoyed it very much yeah oh i had one other thought it's not about yeah. scara but i thought it was a good episode of jack making funny remarks like i feel yes. like it was happening quite a bit and i enjoyed yeah, there was all a of it yeah there was a good amount of comic yeah. relief on his part, yeah. Like asking the Jeffa that is, you know comes in the room, like where's the bathroom and like <laughs> just true. Yeah, I don't know. Although I also appreciated Daniel's comment about how he was going to just go tell the captain to yeah. turn the ship around. That's true. That was good too. Daniel doesn't. I feel like Daniel doesn't too often get the silly quips like that, <laughs> so I wasn't really expecting one like that from him. Although he did get the uh, upload the virus to the mothership one in the oh, last that's episode. Right. Yeah, that's true too. I loved. <laughs> I loved that one so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good point. So there was there was good humor in this too. Yeah. Yeah. So Kathy, what is next for me and not for you um, in the next episode? I, since you won't, be I would me tell you, I'm me. but I normally watch read the description from Netflix, and I don't have Netflix anymore. <laughs> it's true. It's all over for me. All over. Um, Game over. Here. So the next episode we're watching is season two, what? episode one. Oh my goodness. We just watched Within the Serpent's Grasp, and the next one is The Serpent's Lair, is called. Oh. As a fleet of gold warships head toward Earth, the Stargate facility sends the best of American society through the Stargate to a safe alpha site. That's not... <laughs> well, it's good that they specify American society. That's not a great description. What is <laughs> no. that? Oh, that's... Is yeah. it doing that stupid thing that they... I said they did when I was watching... When they just do, like, the opening scene? Let me see what this booklet says. I don't know. Let me just read the booklet just for funsies. I've got the DVD booklet right here. The booklet. Yeah. <laughs> This one says, when a fleet of gold warships launches a surprise attack on Earth, the SG-1 team uses the Stargate to board an enemy ship with enough explosives to destroy the entire force. Well, that, that's how they explained the... We've that already, already happened. That Thanks, Booklet. Wait, there's one more <laughs> sentence. Oh, okay. But the team's capture suddenly turns their objective into a suicide mission. <gasps> Whoa. Is that the capture we just saw, or is there another capture coming up? I don't know, but I'm guessing no. that did not tell us anything we didn't know either. <laughs> so. No, <it> did not. <laughs> so both descriptions, pretty useless. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. But at least we know that some Americans will be safe and <laughs> screw all the other countries. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay then yeah on that note as always thank you for listening if you haven't already hit subscribe please do so so that you can get all of our episodes as soon as they're released every other monday or you can also find us on youtube if that is your preferred way of consuming podcasts reviews and likes are very greatly appreciated as is word of mouth because that is a really good way to help more people find our podcast if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us. We're at stargatesing at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter. We're at stargatesing. 
<laughs> you can like and share our Facebook page or join our Facebook group. And you can also find us on patreon.com slash stargazing if you're feeling generous and want to help support the show financially. And you can check out our website. We are at stargazing.space for that. I'm Mary. I'm Kathy. <laughs> and you've been listening to Stargazing. The very young do not always do as they're told. The very young do not always do as they're told. <laughs> And the team is in the, God, what were we calling it? Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Operations? Is that the word we were using for that room where the computers are? They're all covered in cloth? Oh, I just call it the control room. Control room. Thank you. I was like, yeah. why can't I remember that? <laughs> wow. All right. It's a very complicated, complicated yeah. term. <sighs> you know, that room where all the controls are. What was that called again? <laughs> oh, God damn it. I don't remember. I think Operations could be an okay name for it. But... <laughs> yes, it could. <laughs> but that's not the one I've been saying either. So, <laughs> anyway. Everyone, everyone will be like, what the fuck is Operations? Yeah. <laughs> Where's Operations? So we see the Stargate covered over with some sort of cloth or tarp. And the team is in the control room. When Jack comes in, the whole uh, the whole center there, the whole the whole oh my god brain. <laughs> you know what the problem is? I wrote operations in my notes, and now that's what my brain wants to do. Okay, you can call it operations if you'd like. Yeah. I think we've established that well yeah. enough that people will understand. <laughs> yeah. at this point. our listeners are smart. Otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't be listening. That's true. <laughs> but are they as smart as Mary? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Also, Teal'c. Remember, Teal'c is a pretty smart guy. He'll understand. He will. So, he is a smart guy. No one asked, <laughs> but we'll tell you how smart he is. There are very few people as smart as me and Teal'c. As evidenced by my bad grammar in that <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Continue.